Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivo Siegmann, and welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is co-organized by the University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester, and Liverpool John Moores University. Today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University and will be presented by Professor Krasimira Tsaneva Atanasova from the University of Exeter. This week, I would also like to thank all of you in the audience for attending the seminar this semester. Next week will already be our last session for this year. By pure chance, both this week's speaker as well as our speaker for next week will actually be from the University of Exeter. So next week, we will have a talk by Christian Bick. I don't know if you know Christian. <laughs> I, I know Christian very well. We're both Hans Fischer oh. fellows at uh, Duke. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, it will um, all end in exit <laughs> this semester for us. So I would now like to introduce to you um, Krasimira. So Krasimira studied mathematics at the University of Plovdiv in Bulgaria, where she got her undergraduate and uh, her master's degree. She then moved to New Zealand to study for a PhD with James Sneed. And I think you got your PhD in 2004. Yes. The first time I heard about Casimira was five years ago, because, uh, sorry, not five years ago, five years later. So I think um, that's a bit longer now, 10 years ago. So I moved to New Zealand um, as well as a postdoc. And um, one paper by Casimira uh, on calcium waves was one of the first things that I was given to learn what um, calcium dynamics was all about. Um, after her PhD, Casimira um, had two short postdoc postdocs, I think, one with the National Institute of Health in the USA and one at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And uh, then you moved to the University of Bristol as a lecturer and um, you finally became a professor in Exeter in 2013. And I think since 2013, you have been there. Yes. Um, Casimira is a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, a Hans Fischer Senior Fellow, fellow of the Institute of Advanced Study in Munich. So you already mentioned this. And I think in the background, you can see the logo of the Technical <laughs> University of uh, Munich. And yeah, you're also an associate member of the Bulgarian Academy of Science. I'm looking very much forward to your talk on an integrative mathematical experimental approach to pulsatile hormone dynamics. Um, over to you, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ivo, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak um, at this seminar today. It's, a, it's my pleasure. And um, yeah, the topic of my today, the topic of the, today's uh, talk is pulsatile uh, hormone dynamics, as you already mentioned. And I will uh, uh, begin by uh, giving you a brief outline of, of, um, of this presentation. So I will uh, introduce the reproductive system. I'm going to talk exclusively about uh, pulsatile uh, reproductive hormones. Um, I will present a mechanistic model of the GnRH pulse generator. I will explain uh, what these, uh, these things mean. Um, I will then uh, demonstrate uh, the behavior of the model and uh, some model predictions and how we uh, did experimentally validate these predictions in, in vivo, in freely behaving animals. Um, I will spend the last part of my talk discussing some clinical applications of, uh, of these uh, of uh, investigations, um, specifically implications for management of menopause uh, and I will briefly describe some statistical analysis and statistical modeling that we are doing at the moment um, in relation to uh, real measurements of reproductive hormones and personalized modeling of, uh, of reproductive hormone dynamics in humans. So starting with um, an overview of the system, the reproductive system is uh, controlled by the so-called reproductive or HPG axis. HPG stands for uh, hypothalamus, pituitary, and gonads. Um, it really spans the entire body 
of an animal or, or, or a human. And um, it, is, um, uh, it is characterized by interactions between, uh, as the, the name of the axis says, hypothalamus, pituitary, and gonads. So the, uh, the specialized, there are specialized cells in the hypothalamus. Uh, this is a brain region um, that secrete a messenger called GnRH. I already mentioned this, uh, this name. GnRH stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone, and it is secreted by um, this population of neurons that are located in the hypo hypothalamus. Um, when secreted, uh, this, uh, this messenger or gonadotropin releasing hormone neuropeptide uh, crosses the brain blood barrier and stimulates a specialized population of cells in the pituitary gland called gonadotrophs. They are the targets for this, uh, for this uh, messenger GnRH. And uh, following stimulation by GnRH, the gonadotrophs secrete the so-called first, uh, first hormones of reproduction, uh, LH and FSH. And these then travel uh, through the bloodstream to the gonads. These are ovaries and um, the testes in men, ovaries in women, uh, where they uh, stimulate further uh, secretion of uh, and production of sex steroids. And then these feed back into the brain and uh, suppress the activity or the secretion of GnRH. So it is a, it is a whole body system and involves uh, the brain and uh, various um, uh, endocrine glands that are located in various parts and involves circulation of these messengers uh, throughout the bloodstream as it's illustrated in this um, in this uh, here diagram. Um, it is highly dynamic and is extremely important for uh, fertility, uh, proper fertility and um, uh, reproductive hormone um, dynamics and management. So disruption of the system leads to, uh, to um, a range of, uh, of uh, hormone related uh, disorders, not just infertility but uh, other, um, other conditions as well. And in our work and what I'm going to present today, we have been predominantly focusing on um, investigating the driver of uh, these dynamics. Um, and I will explain, yeah, it's uh, circled, it's, it's in the brain, in the hypothalamus. Um, and uh, we have been modeling the activity of uh, the neuro neuronal population involved in driving secretion of GnRH and uh, following the, the follow-up with LH. So um, this, this uh, system has been studied for a long time and it has been known for quite a while since the 1970s uh, as illustrated by this, uh, this uh, images here taken from a paper from 1978 science paper where um, in the US, researchers in Nobel's lab have been recording um, the dynamics of these messengers, uh, GnRH and LH, uh, in the brain and in the blood of um, monkeys at that time. And it's, it's been uh, for a long time referred as a classic example of pulsatile dynamics. Um, and uh, what you can see here in this, in this graph is the remarkable correspondence between pulses in the, in the portal uh, GnRH. That's the portal, it's um, where the brain, uh, uh, the, this is the link between the hypothalamus and pituitary, um, uh, where the GnRH crosses the, the blame blood barrier to stimulate the pituitary gland. So there is a remarkable correspondence between pulses and uh, GnRH concentration at that, at that part of the animal and the concentration of LH in the blood. Each pulse of GnRH is associated with the pulse in, in LH. And um, furthermore, um, uh, this, this, this system uh, responds to, uh, in a highly dynamic fashion, to the patterns of stimulation. Uh, as you can see here in the bottom, in the, in this bottom graph, pulsatile secretion of GnRH uh, elicits pulsatile secretion of LH and FSH. However, continuous uh, stimulation by GnRH suppresses 
the activity or the secretion of these uh, first hormones of reproduction. And this is, uh, for many years since these find findings, it has been used as um, um, this, this property of the system has been exploited um, clinically. Um, it is used in uh, treating infertility, the so-called uh, IVF um, program uh, or procedures. It is also used to um, in contraception and for management of some steroid dependent cancers. So it is, a, it is something that clinicians do. And uh, it is uh, incredible that very little is, is understood about the physiological mechanisms uh, that uh, control uh, this, uh, these dynamics. So um, a lot of work has, has gone over the years and um, uh, fast forwarding to 1993, <laughs> This, uh, this picture here shows uh, this, this recording uh, taken from a paper by my now collaborator, uh, Kevin from uh, King's College London, who at the time was a postdoc in Nobel's lab in the US. Uh, what they did here is uh, to measure the activity of um, the neurons in the hypothalamus, which is here on the bottom. This is electrical activity, population level activity in, in, uh, in this part of the, the hypothalamus where it is believed, at that time was believed that the GnRH neurons are located. And you can see that uh, there is very well organized um, pulsatile dynamics uh, on the population level, which is again uh, uh, tight, tightly correlated with pulses of LH in the blood of, uh, of the monkey. Uh, and that, that was the animal system that they were, were, were working with at that time. So they, when they took, when they made these measurements, they believed that they be, they, this activity originates from a population of GnRH neurons. Uh, and uh, that uh, given the findings from the 70s, uh, that would clearly explain these pulses in, in LH. However, with the advances of, um, of uh, imaging and uh, various fluorescent reporters, what we see here in this picture from a paper from 2008 is um, a, like a fluorescent staining of the different populations of neurons in the hypothalamus, um, the same part of the brain where these recordings that I just described were taken from. And the red color shows the the GnRH neurons and the green, a kind of relatively newly discovered at that time population or characterized population of neurons, uh, so-called kispeptin neurons, which are located in the same uh, uh, hypothalamic uh, nucleus. And uh, as you can see, are very much uh, connected and uh, interacting with the GnRH populations of neurons. So that arrow, shows roughly where that recording uh, on the previous slide uh, has, been, his, has been done. And um, you can clearly see that uh, there is this part of the brain is actually occupied by much in much larger proportion by kispeptin neurons. So um, uh, findings like this have uh, brought uh, the kispeptin um, uh, neuronal population to the center of the of attention and um, uh, as a target for investigation. And uh, here, this is just a cartoon slide um, representing the idea. So the question that I will be discussing here in the modeling relates to, uh, uh, is it possible that this uh, population of, kin of uh, kispeptin neuron uh, is, has something to do with the, uh, with the pulses of LH? And if yes, how, how is exactly this um, uh, disorganized and what are the mechanisms involved. And before I show you our modeling and, and experimental work, just a few more examples from um, other labs which shed some light on, on this question. So um, a group in New Zealand actually that works in this, in this area, uh, since, since then they have now moved to Cambridge uh, in, in, in the UK but this work has, uh, was done when they were still in New Zealand. Um, so what, uh, what, what this slide is showing is uh, the first actually demonstration that these kispeptin neurons uh, indeed have something to do with uh, pulses 
of this uh, reproductive hormone LH. And um, the technique uh, uh, that is being used here is an optogenetic stimulation, which is uh, delivered through a laser that is implanted that's in vivo as well and in mice. So the, the optogenetic fibers are implanted in the brain of the mice and target the light targets a specific uh, population of neurons that express um, uh, light sensitive uh, ion channels, uh, also known by, like, uh, by the name of channel rhodopsins. And this relies on the availability of uh, an animal that expresses selectively these channel rhodopsins in the target part of the, of the brain in this case. So um, here they, they have used such, such mice and they have stimulated uh, this population of kispeptin neurons and measured at the same time the concentration of LH in the blood uh, in, in, in an animal. And um, uh, you can see here that uh, in, a in a mouse where this, uh, this um, channel rhodopsins are expressed, uh, called Kiskri, uh, stimulation by light of certain frequency elicits a pulse in LH and increasing the frequency here increases the magnitude of these pulses. Um, and uh, if it's a mice without uh, these channels expressed, there is nothing here happening. And furthermore, the same group a few years later also showed that um, now using um, genetically enco encoded calcium sensors uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a mouse again, uh, in vivo, um, uh, using photometry, they basically recorded the calcium, uh, the calcium dynamics or the calcium spikes in, in, uh, in this uh, kispeptin neurons and the associated, uh, they also took blood from the, yeah, here it is, they take blood from the tail of the, of the mouse usually every five minutes or so. And then that's how they measure uh, the, the, the pulses in, in the LH in the blood. And we can see here again that uh, calcium spikes are tightly correlated with pulses in LH, um, which, is, um, uh, which is another demonstration of the importance of these uh, neuronal populations in terms of uh, controlling the, the secretion of, of LH and the pulsatility of LH. And uh, uh, while these are demonstration of this, um, of this relationship, the actual mechanism and how uh, this, this exactly works uh, in terms of mechanisms uh, have not really been addressed uh, in, this, in, this, um, in, this, uh, in these papers, in these studies. So what we, what we um, decided to do on the question that we, we decided to address when we, meet, when we met with my collaborators from King's College a few years ago, uh, was to ask what are the dynamic mechanisms responsible for the pulsatile secretion of, of GnRH. And um, particularly focusing on that, uh, that population of, of kispeptin neurons. And now I need to introduce, I uh, have seen probably in my previous slides, um, this, this notation candy. Uh, so that's, uh, this is really uh, stems from the uh, first, uh, first letters of the, uh, of the neuropeptides that are known to be uh, secreted by, by these, uh, these, neuro these neurons in, uh, in the hypothalamus. One of them is kispeptin, and this is the one that drives the secretion of GnRH. But in addition to kispeptin, these, these neurons also secrete uh, something called neurokinin B, which is a positive autoregulator, and uh, dynorphin, which is a negative autoregulator of the activity of these populations of neurons. And hence, um, for short, this, is, this network or these populations are called candy, a candy neuronal populations. So um, we started by developing a network model of these, uh, of these candy neuronal populations by um, uh, considering the levels of um, the positive autoregulator denoted by N the negative autoregulator de denoted by D and the firing rate of, of, the, of individual neurons. Um, but um, soon after, so we put together a network model and we realized that for our purposes, it's sufficient to 
actually look at a um, coarse grained or mean field model because we were mostly interested in modeling and trying to reproduce that figure that I showed you in the beginning of the population level activity of this, uh, of this um, uh, kispeptin neurons. So in the coarse um, grain or mean field representation, what we have is three, three ordinary differ differential equations describing the dynamics of the negative autoregulator, which is um, the dynorphin. That's the first equation, the positive, and then the firing, the mean firing rate of this neuronal population. And each of these is um, given by a Hill function, uh, which, uh, which describes the, um, the activation uh, of, of, um, of, or the, the, positive, the, the positive term, or the, the term that describes uh, the increase in the concentration of, of uh, each of these um, dynamic variables. And in the case of, um, uh, of the endorphin, uh, the, the secretion of the endorphin is, uh, is stimulated or is increased uh, when the firing rate uh, of, of these neurons increases. And hence, here it's uh, dependent on the, on the firing rate V. Uh, then we have um, um, the uh, activation of um, the positive autoregulator or NKB. Here it is also um, increased by um, the firing rate but it's also inhibited uh, by, um, uh, by the action of this negative autoregulator dynorphin. And uh, the firing rate uh, depends on activation due to this positive uh, regulator NKB, but uh, it's uh, also um, dependent through this um, constant parameter in our model uh, that, describes, um, that describes input uh, from, um, from other neuronal populations uh, surrounding these kispeptin neurons, or as I will show you in this, um, uh, in this specific example, in this work that we did, we use this, um, this parameter to represent the level of optogenetic stimulation uh, when we wanted to uh, probe and uh, understand how the model behaves if it's subject to, to stimulation external stimulation um, in, in the case of our collaboration, that is an optogenetic uh, stimulation. So the idea was to use this model to make predictions for experiments done with mice. Um, and uh, we, uh, for that reason, uh, we um, decided to uh, parameterize the model based on uh, data collected uh, in mouse. And this is here on top is a recording of the population level activity, electrical activity in, um, in um, kispeptin neurons or candy neurons uh, in, in a mouse. And uh, here it's the output of the model that's been fitted to this data in terms of frequency and duty cycle using, um, using uh, approxi approximate Bayesian computation a method based on sequential Monte Carlo. So uh, that basically, this is the procedure that we use to parameterize our model. And uh, once parameterized, we looked at um, performing bifurcation analysis to understand the dynamical, um, the dynamics, uh, uh, the dynamical properties of, of the model. So um, I did mention the positive, the negative feedbacks here involved in this, in this little, in this little network. Uh, I should have mentioned that the uh, negative, um, uh, negative interaction is also characterized by evolving on a slower time scale. So one of the first um, things that we, or that we did is to treat, uh, basically use ideas from slow fast analysis and treat that, um, um, uh, that variable as a parameter and uh, study the, the, the structure, the dynamics of uh, this two variable model as a function of this, of this uh, level of the endorphin. And what we find, it's probably not surprising, this is typical for these kind of systems, we find this classical bistable uh, dynamics uh, where the level of the endorphin, um, if dynamic, can switch the system from high firing to low firing and explains the mechanism of oscillations 
observed in the firing rate in this way. So, and again, as you probably uh, all know, same kind of logic is important for ensuring robust and sustained oscillations in many other biological systems. And here are a list of some of them. So what uh, we were really interested to kind of probe here is the effect of external inputs. And in particular, uh, uh, because this was possible to, to test experimentally uh, using um, optogenetic stimulation. So um, using our uh, I basal parameter as a bifurcation parameter and looking at the dynamics of the full three variable model, um, performing numerically bifurcation uh, analysis. Um, here I illustrate uh, what we find. Uh, basically, for low, for low value, va for very low values of this external input, we have a network that is at rest. It's not. Um, it's uh, it's uh, silent. Uh, increasing this this external input uh, drives the system into a, a regime of um, uh, oscillations uh, given by this that's bounded by these two hop bifurcations. This is here the amplitude of the oscillations that we find in the model. And these graphs here shows the frequency uh, increasing, the level of stimulations increases the frequency. And eventually, uh, high level passing the second hop bifurcation, um, what we find is again a silent neuronal population, but depolarized. So high, high firing rate but uh, not oscillatory, not dynamic. And again, this is something very typical for these kind of models. So it's not that surprising that we found this, uh, this kind of dynamics here. Um, what, is, what, was, what is nice is that we were then able to test this experimentally, as I will show you in the next few slides. And a few slides, and uh, we were able to test this experimentally and also in vivo in, uh, in uh, freely moving animals. So um, as we were developing this model uh, in my collaborator's lab in King's College, they were setting up uh, themselves to be able to perform up to gen genetic stimulations with, um, with mice that have um, this um, candy neuronal populations expressing channel rhodopsins. So light stimulation can excite these, these neuronal populations. And um, they can control the pattern of light stimulation. And then they can also measure the levels of LH uh, hormone in the blood of, of, of the mice. And um, I'll just quickly go, the prediction that we made is that if we increase the level of stimulation, the um, a silent or constant level of LH in the blood will turn into pulsatile, uh, uh, pulsatile um, secretion of LH or pattern. Uh, and then increasing further this level of stimulation will um, again silence the system. And as, we, as uh, this, um, this stimulation is increased, the frequency should also increase. And um, we were pleased and excited to find uh, that this is exactly what happens in, in the animals. This is, uh, this is here a picture that shows the result from uh, a representative example uh, from the experiments that were done in the lab. And here see in the control, no stimulation at all. There is no LH being secreted in the blood. Uh, a little bit of stimulation, uh, still nothing. Increasing further brings about pulses, further increase, increases the frequency and eventually high level of stimulation, uh, again, uh, uh, re reduces the activity of the system to a, uh, to a constant, uh, constant level of, of LH. Um, so that was, that was very nice. Uh, and in addition to, to this, uh, in the lab, they were also able to combine this with pharmacological manipulation to further confirm that this is indeed uh, how uh, that, um, that control of uh, this pulse dynamics works. And um, there were two model, there were two other model prediction that were confirmed experimentally. One of them relates to 
uh, in addition to simulating optogenetically, also blocking the negative feedback. And in the model, the prediction is that the range of the pulsatile dynamics will increase. Uh, uh, and this is here the experiment uh, of, um, of applying optogenetic stimulation in the presence of this pharmacological agent that blocks the negative feedback. So here we can see again, nothing, a little bit of stimulation, uh, still nothing, no pulses. Applying the, the blocker um, is again, uh, doesn't lead to any pulses, but both are able to, to elicit pulse style dynamics. And this is like, I have a little cartoon here showing how one might in interpret this um, in this, um, uh, this, this experimental finding, looking at this two parameter bifurcation diagram, where now we vary the, the basal network activity and the level of um, uh, the level of blocking the negative feedback. And these are the uh, these are the curves that describe the location of the hop bifurcations that I showed you in the previous slide. And similarly, um, in the lab, they are able to block the positive feedback. And blocking the feed positive feedback leads to a decrease in the range where pulsatile dynamics uh, is observed, which is not surprising, and it makes sense. Um, and this is here again experimental verification of this um, of this observ of, of this prediction, where uh, again we have pulses elicited by uh, by optogenetic stimulations stimulation that are they then blocked by uh, uh, blocking this uh, uh, this uh, this positive positive feedback in the system. And um, yeah, this um, this was very nice and exciting, but. For me personally, what really made it exciting uh, even more is that at the same time when we were developing the model, um, I'll just go back. So this this uh, neurokinin B receptor antagonist is the what the is the the agent that was applied here. And um, around the time when we just finished developing this model, we met a um, clinical uh, clinical group from Imperial College, and they have just published a paper um, about a using or uh, studying uh, such kind of um, receptor antagonist antagonism as a novel treatment for menopausal hot flashes. And they had data from humans, humans and um, um, they were really interested in our modeling. So um, since then we have been collaborating with them as well and looking at human data. And what you can see here is um, these are now pulses of LH measured in women. And um, this is uh, this is like the the times at which they experience hot flashes, uh, which are self-reported by the by the participants in the trial. And the first interesting question that they posed was the clinician was um, uh, this observation that in some in some women you have pulses that correlate very tightly with um, with the LH pulses as it has been. Uh, clinically accepted for many, many years since some science papers from the 70s. It was a dogma in the field that each, each hot flash is associated with pulse. But they were seeing that in other women, this is not at all the case. And they were interested whether we can uh, somehow model this or quantify it. So we started very simply uh, using statistical modeling. And uh, we our aim really was to uh, try to give a reliable estimates of the LH pulsatility. In other words, um, detecting when there are uh, pulses or identifying pulses, as it says here. Uh, along, along this, uh, using statistical modeling enables us to provide bars, uh, to provide error bars on the estimates. And ideally, we want to infer mechanisms and make predictions. So we started very simply using this um, idea of uh, that uh, uh, applies uh, a, a Bayesian model um, to, to account for, for pulses uh, observed ex experimentally. And um, we applied this to the data uh, from the clinical collaborators. This is here an example of, of what you get from this, uh, this, time, this type of Bayesian spectrum analysis as, uh, as um, it's, it's known uh, it's been um, it's been called so here by fitting uh, using like a Fourier series really that's what it is so fitting a Fourier series in a Bayesian fashion to LH pulses 
what one does or obtains is a distribution that describes the mean period or frequency along with um, variance or how certain uh, once the, uh, how certain the model is uh, about this uh, this estimate of the mean of the mean period and we applied this to the data from the from the clinical trial that I just described to look at how uh, hot flashes correlate with with pulses in all the participants and here you see outputs of this of this analysis with red we have the the basin spectrum analysis modeling of the hot flashes and with black for for the LH pulses in the blood and um, um, basically there is a summary here showing that in, in in some women the correspondence is very good but it's just one of the participants in most ca cases it's not so um, that uh, that um, quantitative and um, robust modeling of the data was good enough to to be published to, to kind of um, extend or contradict in some sense that dogma about the relationship between uh, hot, flash, hot flashes and LH pulses and has opened a lot of questions in terms of uh, how what really underlines the hot flashes, uh, which are one of the uh, biggest issues uh, that women uh, or symptoms that women, 70% of, of women experience during, uh, during menopause and that could, can, that could, can, that could continue for, for years. So um, this is really now an ongoing work and um, uh, we have, um, uh, we are continuing the modeling and the investigation and hoping that using our mechanistic model, we can um, perhaps shed light uh, on, on this regulation as well. But what I really want to, to tell you uh, in the remaining few minutes of my talk is another, that's yet another uh, exciting um, uh, link uh, that, that happened uh, at, uh, at the time when we, we met our clinical collaborators from, uh, from Imperial. So they were also working with a group that was developing um, um, an assay to measure LH, uh, potentially uh, able to, to measure LH um, uh, concentration continuously and in real time. Um, just to put a little bit of a background, at the moment, the way the concentration of LH is measured um, in the blood is by taking a little, um, taking samples, blood samples, and then, and then post-processing them using an antibody uh, to construct the, uh, these, these traces of, um, of concentration levels in animals or humans in both cases. So it's a very long and very laborious process, especially uh, because it has to be, uh, it has to be observed uh, over days and uh, 24 hours each day. Uh, so you can imagine these women that uh, were performing the clinical trial, they, ha they had to be, they had to stay in the hospital uh, for seven days and they had to give blood from, from their arm um, to a nurse every 10 minutes or so uh, in order to, to construct this, um, this, this, uh, this data for that clinical trial. So with, uh, with this um, possibility uh, or these new developments, the so-called optimers potentially, that's very new. It only came out last year and it's really setting, um, um, calibrating and developing the technology. Uh, but potentially in the future, these optimers would allow for continuous and real-time much, 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 much less invasive measurement of, of these uh, hormone concentrations where uh, subhumans can take, women or men could take this in their homes and uh, just with a little patch and, um, and um, their, their levels, their hormonal levels could then be monitored and potential problems could be, could be easily identified and uh, diagnosed. But what we really did in this paper, this very first paper is to actually use our modeling, our statistical modeling, modeling to compare the uh, measurements obtained using the gold standard, the antibody uh, measurement technique, and the optimer-based um, uh, um, output. Um, and this was done using the same samples that were used in in the clinical trials of of my uh, imperial collaborator, and then they were sent to to the group that was developing these optimers and um, they were processed using the optimer 
And this is here uh, just an example showing how in, in several different conditions, healthy uh, menopause and uh, that's a hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is uh, a condition uh, that affects young women and is um, related with uh, inability to have children um, and other, other, other problems and complications. Uh, here it just shows the, that uh, our analysis was able to confirm that uh, the optimer is working, um, optimer measurements are working equally well to the antibody ones. And this is now uh, under development, further development. And uh, I did mention mechanisms a few times. So where we're going now with this work. Um, so the, the Fourier series approximation of these pulses is, is, is fine, but it doesn't really tell us anything about, uh, about mechanisms. So we're looking now at developing a bit more uh, uh, sophisticated um, uh, stoch uh, stochastic or statistical models. And we're, we have started with something that has um, um, uh, here a representation of this neuronal population on the, or the GNRH pulse generator that can be uh, on and off in two states. And in the, sta in the on state, it can release LH. And in the, in the off state, um, uh, there, there is only basically a basal rate of, of release, and then LH is, is cleared. So we have, um, we have LH levels as an observable variables that we can inform uh, or fit to the experimental data, and we have the uh, generate pulse uh, generator or the hypothalamic drive as a latent variable in this analysis. And we are now in the process of applying it to try to identify pulses and infer some mechanisms. The, the future is to complicate this, um, this here um, simple on and off uh, two-state model of the, of the GNRH pulse generator and to inform it by the mechanistic modeling that we did using the mouse, uh, the studies that I showed you with, uh, with, with mice. But um, here very briefly, some preliminary results of, so we're basically able using this, this relatively simple model to account for a, for a large range of, data uh, recorded from humans. This is like a example output of, of the modeling. And um, in addition, we are able to detect um, the, or to predict what the activity of the, of the hypothalamic drive would be. And the idea is to use this uh, as an uh, indicator of where is a, where, when there is a pulse in LH and when there isn't, this is a very, this is quite important from clinical point of view. As you can see some, some of these, it's very difficult just looking at these measurements in the blood to say whether a fluctuation in the trace is a pulse or not. So having an additional information uh, about the hip hypothalamic drive that uh, is responsible for these dynamics would enable a more informed decision uh, in terms of identifying pulses. And um, we're also, um, fit using the same approach to fit data from different data sets. This is an example of a data set from 13, 13 women uh, uh, and that are menopausal women. And uh, here, um, using this, this method, we can construct posterior distributions for the various model parameters. And we have done this for um, also a male data set and hypothalamic amenorrhea. And um, what we find if we plot two of the model parameters uh, using that information from the posterior distributions in, um, um, in, um, in this place, uh, this plane here spanned by the positivity parameter and the secretion rate, we can see clear clustering of the different types of, um, of um, conditions that this, uh, this, this, uh, these distributions or these parameter values represent um, following uh, fitting to, to, to our model. So this is very promising uh, in terms of um, potentially being used as a, as a, uh, as a tool, uh, to, as a part of a clinical decision support tool, which can help um, diagnose uh, or identify uh, uh, more um, quantitatively uh, the, the condition of the patient in, or a patient or a healthy individual in terms of their hormonal levels and then subsequently inform uh, treatments or management of, um, of, of their state if it needs a clinical intervention. 
So uh, with this, I, I'd like to finish by uh, acknowledging the contribution of uh, my long-term postdoctoral fellow, Margaritis, who has been instrumental and um, for, this, uh, for this work. And the results that I have shown you have all been achieved in collaboration with Margaritis. And he's been, been funded initially by our EPSRC Center for Predictive Modeling in Healthcare, and then from a BBSRC project grant that we have with uh, Kevin Auburn from King's College London. And now this work, the clinical part of the work, uh, the clinical aspects of this work are done in collaboration with Wojit Dillo from Imperial College London, who is now a co-investigator on our recently funded EPSRC hub for quantitative modeling in healthcare. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kazimira, for your really nice talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, if you like, you can either unmute yourself or you can ask them in the chat. Shall I stop sharing my screen? Maybe I should. Um, the question is if sometimes it might be useful to go back to a yeah, slide. That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> I think I know of at least one question from um, the chat that um, might be useful to be answered using your slides, to be honest. May yeah, I answer? May, may I ask this question? Yes. So it's um, basically a simple question about the uh, biological system. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about the cartoon that you showed um, of the GNRH neurons. In the very so, beginning? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, yeah, how um, closely are these arrows um, related to the actual physical, uh, sorry, uh, biological system. You mean here? I jump in. All I were, it's just, I, th th thank you very much for that talk. It's kind of like right up my street, um, what you're, what you're yeah. doing there. Um, okay, so it wasn't that slide. It was either one after, that's the first one, is it? No, it was earlier than that even, I think. Right it, at the beginning, right at the, oh. Right here? The, yeah, yeah, this one, right, yeah, yeah. So, slide one. So I could, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to take over your talk and stop and ask you all your questions, mm -hmm. all these questions, which I could have easily done as we went through. But like, I kind of had a question on every slide probably. So yeah. slide one, um, is it an accident that you've drawn on the top right neuron, that gonadotrophic, that you've drawn all those inputs running along the side of that axon like that? You mean, a, yeah? Yeah, because you don't normally get inputs like, but I asked for a reason. I'm not being quite as pedantic as it might sound. Um, running along the side, you've, you've, you've got these inputs all coming along the axon. That's kind of quite unusual. Normally you would have inputs either on a presynaptic terminal or you would have inputs on a cell body in a dendrite or something. But the reason I ask that, just so I don't panic you, is because I've worked on the hypothalamus with both modeling and with, um, with various kinds of uh, physiological and immunohistochemical things. Mm -hmm. And when I showed a picture of one of my neurons that I was working on, it had a load of little nobbles going along what otherwise would have looked like an axon. And, um, and everybody was pointing out that that looked unusual because it looked like it was either secretory or receiving inputs along its length there, where you but, kind of wouldn't have expected it. So when I saw this, I thought, oh, oh, that looks kind of like I might, that kind yeah. of looks like that might be true. So is that, so do you know whether that you've just drawn it like that because it's a convenient way to show inputs or are they actually along the axon? So I think, and that's uh, something which um, I think uh, this group in New Zealand that I showed some results that now moved to Cambridge, and it will again boil down to my supervisor that Ivo mentioned. He worked with them to model these GnRH neurons, and they actually have some evidence that this axonic um, interaction is, is happening like that. This is not the reason. Actually, this is a picture drawn by my postdoc, so he's probably the best to. <laughs> To, to answer why it's, he's drawing it right like this, but from my also being in this field for quite a while, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and um, and there are there are um, in the hypothalamus the neurons are different than the rest of the brain in some sense that they do communicate via their axons in terms of um, receiving input. So their axons are like dendrites as well, uh, yeah. and that's not just for GnRH neurons. That's also true for the oxytocin um, yeah. okay, stimulating yeah. ones. There are a group in Edinburgh that has been modeling for this for quite a while. And um, um, so, so yeah, so um, 
to me, it's um, given my knowledge, limited knowledge about the hypothalamus. Uh, mm. that's, that's the explanation I can give. Um, so, but these, these neurons in the hypothalamus are, yeah, are, are different than the, than the rest of the brain. And I think their definition of dendrites and axons is not exactly- Yeah, so I mean, I, I, that would kind of fit what I was yeah. saying, but it's just, I put, you know, I put the picture up at a, you know, at a conference as you do, actually talking about something else in the way that you are. And it's people were pointing <laughs> and kind of going, doesn't look right. And I was kind of like, well, that's an awkward situation because this is kind of what it looks like. It's incredible how little people know about the hypothalamus and the yeah, neurons. Considering there. how many of us have worked on it for so long. Yeah. 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 It's true. Yeah. So I don't know if this is, was the question that Ivo was asking. But, it is uh, the question Ivo was asking because that's when I paste it up. I just, I just thought asked by somebody else like that, it might sound like I was being picky as opposed to actually a genuine question pertaining to something I've seen with my own yeah data. That, that was all sorry evo to no problem yeah. <laughs> if there are no um other questions at the moment i could ask a question mm -hmm. i think this is actually a question that um richard was interested in as well um you showed some uh examples for bayesian modeling mm -hmm. um so did you um specify for this these different modeling um approaches did you specify um any interesting priors because i mean i do bayesian modeling as well but i uh, often don't really show the priors because they are quite not the, the priors here the priors here are just flat they are uniform distributions okay yeah uh because we don't have any prior knowledge really uh, right yeah okay i'm yeah. sure that for this one for the for the one the base the so-called bayesian spectrum um he used uh, uniform priors this latest thing that I've shown here is really late, you know, it's really work in progress. I, my understanding is that Margaritis is using uniform priors, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, to, to be honest, when I was thinking about the priors, it was right at the beginning. I mean, uniform priors are very, are very brave. It just takes a longer <laughs> process. Yeah, it takes a long time. How, yes, many, exactly. how many parameters were you actually, uh, you know, were you actually Generate. So here, here is quite, a few. Yep. but in the first one, it's only two. It's very oh, it's simple. Only two. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. for the Bayesian here, we just have, you see, B1, B2. Okay. Yeah. Well, not only two. Yeah. And Omega. Yeah. Three. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah it's, it's not too bad. With no. that. I actually, the, uh, the thing that you were saying, uh, Evo, do you, I mean, does, I, 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 I um, Bayesian spectrum, I've not, I, what's, what's, what's this? Is this a sort of a, it looked really useful. Is that different to? Uh, so it is, see, it's from that paper, from okay. that paper by um, guys from um, John Innes. Um, they've developed this for actually calcium, calcium pulses. I, I kind of know them because I used to cooperate with them on modeling calcium, but, um, then they came up with that, uh, they call it Bayesian model development for frequency detection in biological time series, but they did it really for detection of detecting pulses in calcium imaging data. It looks and interesting and useful. It looks yeah. interesting and useful. It works really well, as you can see here in this, it's, it's pretty, yeah, here, this is really messy data. And it, it does a good job. Yeah, I, I, I might check that out because we're all, you know, masses of the stuff I'm looking at in my lab is, is an oscillation of and one, it's not a noisy oscillation of one yeah one. exactly that's what it is developed for exactly for noisy oscillations and it's not that difficult to implement nor to that time time consuming to run what what are you using are you using r or pymc or matlab matlab here noise? sorry it's in matlab matlab okay yeah but i think they have a they have a package that's in r if I, if I recall, this paper, I this never paper. Want to load another package. No. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, no, if, it's an, if you can import it, then fine. But to actually, there are, you know, you've got these things, you just want to be able to run your own code into it rather than have to like upload the data to another. I completely understand. Um, it's my, you know what, feel free to email me if you, if you like. Thanks. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. We're going to be very happy to share. Margaritis is going to share his code with you in whichever format because he's, he does any, he, he can, yeah, basically he uses all sorts. He's very good programmer, so he can program and reprogram stuff. He yeah. likes MATLAB, but sometimes he uses R as well. So yeah, I don't know what, which one you are using, but. Um, a, a Python, PYMC. Ah, you're using Python as well. Well, Margaritis lately is using Python too, because I like Python myself as well. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. 
there's there's a thing i don't know where else found this with matlab if you're doing very very long computations you just get slower and slower. i mean it's really trivial but it gets slower and slower after a day of like simulation python just is going at the same speed in i know computers. python is much better i fully but, i'm with MATLAB you starts to slow down you have to stop it and restart it and stuff yeah. um if it doesn't hang mm, absolutely i agree and with the uh, stochastic version you're talking about at the yeah. end of the of the basic model are you talking about doing this where you set up like 500 versions 500 stochastic neurons which do this or one which has a probability which works in a stochastic way so both are possible i guess i was thinking the latter yes, <laughs> my, my, yes. we are going to start with the yeah with just like with one <laughs> yes with one yes because yeah. otherwise yeah um what what i was uh, what i was getting at here is that i'm personally keen to make this a bit more complicated at the moment is very simple it's just yeah. on and off yeah, yeah. um uh, use some of the ideas uh, th some of the knowledge that we have about the interaction between you know dynorphin and nkb and um uh, the firing rate and um extend this simplicity you know simple representation here um yeah to take into account, the, especially the NKB, because that's a target for treatment. So if somehow we can build into uh, the effects of the applying, you know, these, um, these drugs to relate to the clinical trial, that would be ultimately. Yeah, where... I mean, there's masses of NKB receptors throughout yes. the hypothalamus, so that it, 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 I'm surprised if practically it works out as a therapeutic, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are absolutely right, and probably that is why it also helps with hot flashes because the hot flash, the temperature regulator, is in that adjacent nucleus, right? The PV something, and then um, NKB receptors are over there as well, which yeah, is yeah. 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 So, so uh, that's one of the you know one of the exciting things to see with these new AAV 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 vaccines that are coming in is that potentially they could be used in a not a vaccine but in a kind of a control way to get something more selective. Yeah. Than, you know, drug like NKB in there. So, uh, yeah, you're absolutely you, you right. You can opt optogenetically control it. You could control it with something else as well if you can get mm. if you've got that technology. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a really interesting discussion, actually. Yeah, I don't know if there are any further questions. Um, We've passed the hour. I think people have had to the time. We have passed the hour, yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. some people have already left. So uh, maybe I will just announce for the few people who are still there that the next talk next week will be um, at 1 p.m., not at 2 p.m., because um, this is a University of Liverpool seminar. It will again be someone from Exeter. So um, thanks a lot for today to you, Krasimira. Um, and um, next week we will have um, Christian Bick from um, Exeter as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.